Paul Fritschner joined by former Xavier player Zach Hankin. Zach, thanks for taking the time to talk with me this afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Doing well. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Oklahoma visiting uh, my girlfriend and family, kind of like stuck here in quarantine with them for a little while. But it gets yeah. me a little bit warmer weather too, so that's okay. So first off, let's start off with how things went overseas, where you played, how the season went, and just starting your career and your professional career after you come out of Xavier. Yeah, so I, uh, um, you know, I played in the summer league for a little bit, got a little bit of exposure there uh, with Philadelphia 76ers. Um, and then I ended up signing with a team called Aaron Nimborg, which is the uh, a team in the top league in the Czech Republic. And they also play in um, the FIBA Basketball Champions League, which is uh, kind of like a European international league. Um, and so, you know, I went over to the Czech Republic. It's about an hour away from Prague, uh, the town I was in, you know, really beautiful, small, you know, back city or back town yeah um in europe and we had a pretty good season we went undefeated in uh the czech league for as long as the czech league went on it got canceled a little bit early um and we did actually get to win the czech league cup um champions league we had the best record in regular season uh 12 and 2 and so we were a number one seed and we ended up just getting through the first round of playoffs in which we we advanced it's like the best two out of three um kind of like the nba does the best of seven um and it was great, you know, being able to, I got to, for Basketball Champions League, I got to travel, you know, to Russia, to uh, the Canary Islands, to Greece, you know, I got to go drive through Athens. It was, it was really cool um, and a really, really great experience. Did you run into any players over there that you knew from playing here in the States? Um, I ran into a few guys that, you know, I knew of. Um, There's the kid who played for um, Gonzaga, Gino. I forget his last name. Uh, you know, he, he was playing for Gonzaga this last year. You know, he was in Hawaii at the same time. We were in Hawaii uh, last year for Xavier. Um, and, you know, De- DeMonte Dodd, he played for Maryland a couple of years ago. Ran into a couple of guys. I actually played two exhibition games against um, Yancey Gates. Really? Yeah, it's just out of nowhere. Like, uh, we, we scrimmaged this Polish team twice, and he was, you know, he was my matchup as a center, so that was kind of cool. Um, just to kind of run into people <laughs> like that. Gino Crandall from Gonzaga, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crandall, yeah. 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 He yeah. was actually – he was in the Czech League, and, and uh, he was doing pretty well. Yeah. Uh, so you go over there and you play, and then all of a sudden, was it your own decision to come back to the States for your health and safety, or was the league canceled, or how did you find out with everything going on with this virus that you had to come back here? Yeah, so uh, my agent and I were being very cautious. You know, we were talking, you know, almost every day about, you know, wh- where the situation was and how it was changing. And um, both of our leagues were suspended. You know, Champions League was suspended and Czech League was suspended. And Czech League eventually got canceled. Uh, and they weren't doing an announcement yet about Champions League. And I was kind of pushing, me and my agent were kind of pushing to talk with um, the GM of our team and say, like, hey, we want to go home before we get barred from going home. You know, we want to, I want to get home before I can't go back home. Um, and luckily, even with all the travel restrictions, um, all the countries around the world were basically like letting foreigners out and letting natural citizens in, but like that was it. Um, so we were watching that and it was, it was volatile because, you know, every day something would change or there'd be a new announcement on a restriction and you were just kind of dreading hearing, like waiting to hear that, bam, you're stuck. Um, so eventually, um, after the Czech league got canceled and champions league, they just were postponing as long as they could, they wouldn't put out an announcement besides just suspending it. Um, so our team eventually just said, all right, like send the foreigners home. We'll negotiate how to figure out like the rest of this year's contracts. And, um, and then once I got home, champions league said that they were taking the rest of the playoffs, which was like, we advanced from 16 to eight. So we got to the round of eight they're just taking those and pushing it back to the next year's team. So in like September or off, they're going to play the the championship for this last year with totally different teams, different coaches. It made no sense whatsoever. Um, <laughs> yeah. We were watching and we, we were just kind of pushing like, listen, like we'll come back if we need to come back. I'll come back and finish the season if I need to, like they started back up, but I would rather be home than stuck in my apartment all day, you know, and not even be able to go outside. 
So where do things stand now? Are you just waiting to hear what you can do and where you can go? Um, so, I mean, right now I'm still, my agent's still negotiating the rest of the contract. I was in for a one plus one, you know, so I could, it was like a player option, basically a player and a team option. So you play the one year, uh, my rookie season, you know, you see how it goes and either the team can buy you out or you can buy the team out in the summer. Um, so, you know, I haven't made any kind of decision yet. Um, you know, there's still a lot of things even this summer to look at of if summer league can, you know, continue and I can get into summer league and then maybe get some other exposure or if, you don't even know if there's going to be teams, you know, a lot of teams next year or a season next year, you know, things are still so volatile. So um, right now we're just kind of taking it slow. Was there much of a language barrier playing over there that you ran into? Interestingly, like most people in the basketball world, all over the world speak English. Like if they're going to be a professional basketball player, you, they probably speak English and they probably like worked on that because it's a big thing for the industry. Um, I heard that in Spain, they expect you to learn Spanish within two or three months, like all the basketball terms. So you can be coached in basketball in Spanish, but um, all the Czech guys spoke English outside of the team and organization, huge language barrier, <laughs> very, very hard language. The Czech guys, I tried to learn the language. The Czech guys were like, Zach, don't do it. Like it's, it's so, it's unbelievably difficult. It's ridiculous. Don't even try. So I just learned the bare minimum uh, to survive. And uh, besides that, I had the guys translate for me. So did you come back here to the States? Did you go back home to Michigan and then down to Oklahoma or yeah. how did that work? Um, so I traveled back, you know, it was kind of a tough, tough thing to find flights and, and travel plan. That was another thing. Even if I was allowed to come back, we need to make sure we can find flights to actually get me back home. So I ended up uh, staying the night in New York or Newark, Newark, New Jersey, um, because I could only get the flight back to Newark. And then I had to book other flights back to get home to Michigan. Uh, but I got home to Michigan. I did my two, you know, my two weeks of staying home and, and quarantining um and i hadn't seen my girlfriend for eight months so um <laughs> you know we made sure to, to be really safe about it make sure that her family was okay with me coming down after i hadn't done the quarantine go through the airport you know and and be really careful constantly sanitizing my hands and whatnot and um yeah you can still you can still travel but it's, it's still kind of sketchy so what are you able to do now to stay in shape or you do you have a home gym do you have a hoop that you're staying in shape with or how are you working uh, out up in michigan um there is a church i used to go to that has like a, a very like a small gym but like they got two almost full half courts right next to each other um so i've been able to get in there with like just me and my mom doing workouts and stuff i could go running um, down here, I've been working out, um, you know, a lot of, oh, they have some, some workout equipment here. So going on runs and, and it's definitely hard when you don't have a basketball. Um, but staying in shape is definitely a really important thing to do because, you know, things can start back up just as quickly as they stopped. You never know. Yeah. So then you come in to Xavier, um, from Ferris and you're a part of the Xavier community and you pretty much everybody takes you under their wing right away. And, kind of hit it off as a fan favorite and the raise the roof and everything was that just something that you did spontaneously or is that something that's followed you your whole career uh no that was uh that was the first year I did that you know I had a buddy who um I actually knew from from living up in Michigan and he ended up transferring to Xavier for a graduate program the same year I did and he was telling me like oh dude you got to bring back the raise the roof like that's such <laughs> a cool thing. you got to have a signature or something I did it one time and the student section loved it that very first time. And so I was like, all right, I guess this is going to be my thing. And, uh, you know, it was an awesome, just an awesome kind of connection that I could have with the fans. I love being the guy that people, you know, like to watch just because of the energy. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a 30 point a game guy, but you know, I can bring that little bit of energy and make that connection with the crowd and, and have a couple big plays. And, and I, I cherish those times when I could do that and have that connection with the fans. When you're looking at Xavier and the national exposure that the Musketeers get and they play on Fox Sports 1 and the highlights on SportsCenter, you ever go out to a bar or you go out to dinner and you look up and there's the Xavier highlights on TV and you're thinking, wow, from where I came in high school to now I'm just casually eating dinner two hours after the game's over and there I am on TV. Does that set in for you? Yeah, I mean, it's it was, um, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to check myself sometimes. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't, getting too into it because that can be that can be a slippery slope to kind of become a person that you don't want to be when you get too full of yourself you know and it's easy to do when you when you get to you know look up on tv and see that or i go back this last year when i got bored in the czech republic um i would go back and watch some of these big games that i had um in front of thousands of people and 
And it was, a, like I said, it was a surreal experience to be at that level. Um, but I think that kind of where I came from helped me stay humble and stay motivated for what I wanted for my personal goals, for my personal, um, you know, things I wanted to work on and not get so overhyped by myself because, you know, I came from a D2 school that, you know, the gym holds 2000. <laughs> um, and so even though I got to play in Madison Square Garden and have a huge game, like I, I, I was still able to kind of check myself and make sure I was, but it is never something you forget. You know, it's, it's something that um, I'm always going to love remembering, you know, playing, playing in Centos is something like you never get another experience like that. What's your favorite memory from Centos? You have one that sticks out? It's have one that kind of you, you think back or is it just I'm, maybe I'm, a blur I'm, as a whole? I, it's, it really is a blur as a whole. Um, I think being Nova at home, was you know was something that's one of the biggest pluses from last you know this the year that I played um, we had a lot of struggles but that was a huge you know huge thing for me um, my Georgetown game that was the first game I really got to start and me and Tyreek you know kind of came at that game with uh, our, we're starting together for the first time two bigs in we got to show that this works because we liked playing with each other um, so we had to show that a three out two in with two bigs worked and he and I, you know he had 19 and 10 I had I think 21 and 10 and like for those two huge double doubles it was kind of like hey we can we can help this team together and uh, I think that was that's one of my favorite memories too especially I'm, I'm buddies with Jesse Govan now we're in the same we sound like the same <laughs> agent and um so that's kind of something I can always hold over his head is that I had a 21 and 10 against him yeah that's funny do, do you talk with him a lot and, and get to know him or uh yeah I mean we you know we I think we're we were both in Portsmouth the Portsmouth Invitational. So yeah. that was the first time I really got to meet him and hang out. We had a couple um, over summer, the summer league, we had a couple of get togethers in Vegas with our agency. Um, so yeah, we kind of like poke fun at each other, DM each other on Instagram every once in a while. Uh, when we were started going through the Corona thing, I started hitting up guys that I trusted for like, that are also playing overseas to see what they're doing, see what their situation is and kind of get a feel for like, all right, is everybody going home? Are some people trying to stick it out? Like, what, what's the kind of goal? When you look back at, at Xavier and, and those guys that you played with, like when you're playing with uh, these guys overseas, what do, you think, what do you think the Big East provides as far as exposure to being able to play at these big-time levels and, and getting out and getting your name out there and stuff like that? You know, I mean, this, this past year shows how competitive the Big East is. Um, I think it's got a great reputation for, for being a tough league. You know, it's not always um, put up on a pedestal like it was this last year of being considered one of the top leagues or top conferences, but, but it really is just because of the, the toughness that there is, you know, inside the paint, um, guards, you know, uh, the defense on the perimeter. Um, there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of, there's a lot of talent all over the place, but to use that talent and be able to play against some of the, I think some of the best defensive defensive schemes and, and toughest players in the nation. I think that really is what the Big East provides. You know, you're going up against teams that have, you know, huge big guys that, that are um, great, great defensive minded players and can move around the paint really well. And then you got guards who are, you know, handsy and strong on the outsides yeah. and, and really pack line defenses. So, um, if you can show that you can play at that level and then play a, play in a Madison Square Garden game where you've got thousands and thousands of people and, and you're, you know, net, if you can prove that you can handle that pressure and that physicality, um, I think it, it really increases your stock a lot in the eyes of, you know, scouts and other professional teams that are watching you. You were a part of Travis Steele's first year as the head coach and you come in and there's this regime change and you don't have – any experience at Xavier it's not like you're the senior that you've played under coach Mack for three years and then you were recruited by Mack but you're a part of Travis Steele's first actual team he's been a part of this program for so long um, under coach Mack and everything but having to rebuild the program from losing guys like JP and Sean O'Mara and Trayvon and Karam that loaded team that they had to then losing so much of that and now having to rebuild and you can sense among the fans, there's frustration that Xavier's always been so good, yeah. but now all of a sudden two years, it feels like they're down years, but you just, you have to remind yourself that this is all building towards something else as a player. 
being a part of that. What do you feel like is the most important thing to maybe look back on and now see as part of the Xavier program to remember and remind yourself how this rebuild takes place? Yeah, um, I think I think a lot of people don't understand how difficult it is. Even players don't understand how difficult it is for an assistant coach to step up into a head coaching position. That's one of the hardest things you can do. That's something that, you know, I saw, I was the first recruiting class for my fair state coach. He, and I watched him while I was being recruited. I watched him handle his first year where he stepped up from an assistant coach to a head coaching position. And they had a down year too. Um, it almost always happens because the relationships you have with your assistant coach is a lot different than with your head coach. With your yeah. assistant coach, you know, they're like the guys who, if you got an issue with your head coach, you're coming to, they're talking you down. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to almost have more of a friendship because they want to be the guys that when you're down in a game and the head coach is, is all thinking about the game and might scream at you, they're going to be the guys that are talking to you, trying to get you, you know, your, your morale back up, trying to work with you better. And so, you know, they're not always the hard asses. They're the ones that are kind of down there and, and underneath the head coach and, and trying to help you as a person and like more of a personal level. But when you step up to the head coach, now all of a sudden you need to demand that heavier respect from the rest of the players. You can't be their buddy anymore. Now you need that respect. And for a player to watch somebody that they were just making jokes with and kind of making fun of every once in a while, step up into a huge, a, a bigger level, it's, it's tough to do. And, you know, it's just kind of hard to figure out those relationships. And those relationships are what make a team great. Like, you have good relationships, you're going to be a good team. Um, and so it's always a, a hard thing to do. And it, it gets – I mean, obviously, you can see this year was – I feel like this year was, was a little bit better than my year um, because now you've got these younger guys who only know Steele as a head coach. And when you've got guys that only know Steele as a head coach, it's just a different kind of relationship and it's a different kind of energy between them. Um, and it's very beneficial. So, yeah, I mean, it, when, you, when you've been spoiled with some great teams, it's kind of tough to see a couple down years. I get it. Um, but it's just kind of something you got to ride out. And you, can't, you can never judge a coach until they have the time to build their own team. I wasn't Steele's recruit. Like, I was originally Max recruit, and Steele stuck with me. You know, so you need to wait until Steele has almost all of his guys and if you're still having bad, you know, struggles, then you can kind of be like, all right, let's see what's going on. But you can almost never judge a coach until he gets to handpick all the way up, you know, from freshman to senior. Um, yeah. I think he's done a great job inheriting the team. I think he has done a good job building, you know, a different kind of relationship with all the guys that, uh, you know, I played with and that um, he took part in kind of recruiting as the assistant coach. He's done a great job, I think, so far. And, I mean, we – we were what one chart, one blown charge call away from <laughs> getting a, getting a shot at Seton Hall my year uh, in the Big East tournament for the championship, and that would have given us an automatic bid. And I think we handled Seton Hall very well that year. So, you know, he's had a lot of success for those first two years of not even really having his own guys. So I think um, that's really something big that people need to recognize and just kind of hold off and. See, see what he does over the next couple of years, because I think he's going to be great. I think there's going to be, you know, awesome tournament runs coming up. Yeah. I don't mean to open up a, a sore wound here, but I, since you mentioned it, I do want to ask. You are playing with a chance to beat Villanova and advance to the Big East tournament final, which would have given you a shot to play in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And then a blown charge call leads to an elimination in the Big East tournament and then an NIT berth. So in that locker room in Madison Square Garden after that game where you have a chance in overtime, but Villanova just overcomes some things and, mm -hmm. and wins that game. What's that like after that game? Um, you know, for me, it was different because, you know, once again, I, I only had one year with those guys. And it was a tough pill to swallow. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what anybody wanted. But the, some of those guys were a lot – very invested and very invested in this team and this program more so than I was, even though I, I, I you know, I've worked my hardest to be very invested and, and, you know, I loved playing with those guys and I loved that team and I loved the experiences we were having. And I was absolutely disappointed. I was angry at the calls. I was angry at some of the plays that were made. Um, but for me, I always tried to be that positive energy kind of guy and, and look at the positives of it. Look at the fact that I was ecstatic to have played in Madison square garden 
against great teams like that and great players like that. Um, but it was definitely a, a sombering tone. There's some guys that were angry at themselves, angry at the refs. Um, just it's, it's never fun losing. We, we had dealt with plenty of losses that year, but, you know, we were on that, we were on the uptick in that last part of the season. We felt like we were becoming invincible. Um, we had a lot of plays go our way sometimes in, in the end of that year. So for that play not to go our way and then to review it again and see how awful of a call that was. And uh, <laughs> you know, refs, are, refs are supposed to be the, – you know a ref is good when you don't even realize that they're, they're there. That's how you know a ref is good. Um, and I know sometimes you know, refs are put in a situation where they have to make a tough call where one team's going to hate them or the other team's going to hate them. But if you're at that level as a referee and you see some – Little Colin Gillespie start scooting underneath somebody that's in the air. Ah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's still tough to this day to, to to deal with it and talk about it. But yeah, you know it is what it is, and and you take you can't go back and change it. So you know now you just kind of focus on the rest of your career. For those guys, it was more focusing on you know the next year. So yeah, and and the with the way that game ended, and then having to then play in the NIT was there what did you guys feel like you mentioned how much of an upswing you were on at the end of that season that loss to Butler was the snap of I forget I believe it I think it was a five game winning streak might have been four but either way it was a solid winning streak going into that game um, against Butler at Hinkle what did you feel like there was a lot more lineups with you and Tyreek in them did you feel like that was the biggest difference or what was it that led to that just 180 degree turn in that team uh you mean in the in the uptick of like when yeah we yeah it was a struggle to begin the year but then it, toward it, the end you're playing like a ncaa tournament I'll, team a lot of it is you know you got new pieces you got three grad transfers that are seniors and it's and a new coach and you just got to figure stuff out man you got to figure out you know what you really care about you know there was sometimes for me i was thinking like some of these guys need to figure out what they really want out of this team and what they want to do this year. Um, I knew I was always like, I wanted to be the best teammate I could be. I want to win. I want these guys to all care about each other and us to all care about each other and, you know, want to play for each other. And, you know, there's sometimes when there wasn't a lot of trust yet, there wasn't a lot of understanding as basketball players, what, you know, each of us, our tendencies were on the court. Um, but once that trust started to, you know, come and once we all realized, you know, after losing some of these games, like everybody hates this losing thing. Why, what are we doing and what can we do better? Then the ball started flowing better, you know, yep. and, and Steele got on some points of like, you got, you can't do this. You can't do that. You're doing this wrong. And this, if you just listen to me and, and play with each other, like yeah. it clicked, it clicked. And we all did. Everybody bought in. And then, you know, when somebody drove and three people came to them, they made that wide open pass to three ball. And, um, you know, I think everyone just ended up buying in and, and understanding. That's what I was saying. It takes a little bit of time to understand, like, this head coach does know what he's talking about. Right? <laughs> and um, and trusting trusting your coach, trusting your teammates. Um, you know, it, it just takes a little bit of time for everyone to feel each other out and then yeah. trust each other and then, you know, be able to then respect one another when you're getting, you know, butt butting heads and yeah. you know, understanding where that comes from. That comes from wanting to win, not from, you know, hating each other. Yeah. Well, a couple last things here before I let you go. How'd you spend your Easter? Spent my Easter laying around <laughs> doing nothing, <laughs> eating some candy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I got up in the morning and watched church with uh, my girlfriend and her family and uh, did a little mini Easter egg hunt in the house and, just relax. You know, there's not a whole lot of things you can do besides relaxing, getting some workouts in, spending time with people that you care about. Yeah. You've, you've talked a lot about how much you've loved animals, I guess you could say, and, and mm -hmm. everything in your, in your background, environmental science, do anything more with that down there in Oklahoma or what's going um, on with, with the animals right now, Zach? You know, we go on, we go on hikes here and there and uh, I'll try to chase down some snakes that we saw a big snake the other day. I was trying to get to it, but it ran into a river, <laughs> um, but it kind of sucks. Cause I can't, you know, the zoos are closed. The aquariums are closed, um, but we can, we can get outside and go on some nature walks. So we'll probably end up going on a couple more hikes here in the next couple of days and hopefully find some stuff. That's one thing that, uh, Ashley hates is when I when I find a snake and I pick it up and I bring it over to her. 
She does not like that. Doesn't go over well? It doesn't. She's just like, all right, back up and, and, and hold it up 10 feet away, and that'll be okay. <laughs> Zach, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk about some of your favorite memories from Xavier and your experience of playing at CentOS and everything. Appreciate it. Hope everything's going well with you, and you stay safe and stay healthy, man. Best of luck with the rest of your career. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it.